hydropeptide has worked on perfecting anti-aging and skin health through our products. And as I mentioned, we combine scientists and beauty professionals for a well-rounded approach to the brand and the product. And it doesn't stop with Dr. Kitchen and myself. So we talk to doctors around the US and around the world, do clinical studies with them, and get their input on the brand and the products. And we also rely on our global estheticians to give us advice and we hear feedback just like we did yesterday at the master class. And we incorporate all of that into our company. So hyperpeptide uh, began in 2004. Uh, we had uh, our founders um, were young entrepreneurs and uh, they wanted to bring a product that was unique to skincare at the time. Um, one of our founders uh, had his mom was a nutritionist at the University of Washington and she had heard uh, discussions about peptides and this got our founders really excited about a new technology called peptides. And so they began Hydropeptide as one of the first companies to use peptide technology in skincare. Um, since then, we've worked really hard on developing products that were both safe and clean and, and, and very luxurious to use. In 2007, we removed uh, harmful ingredients such as parabens and phenoxyethanol. Um, and this was an important step for us to approach what we call our clean science approach. Um, 2014 was very important because that's the year I started. Um, but this is a, uh, was a significant year for us because we also did a, a brand refresh where we came out with our micro collection. Um, and we used to have just that signature blue color there. And now we have some micro collections that we'll talk a little bit about today. But they represent uh, products for different skin types. Um, and so that happened in 2017, and we really worked hard on starting to create like, this clinical result and luxury experience that we talked about. I mean, of course, we want to tell you a little bit about some of the initiatives that we're doing this year in 2016, including with a, a charity called Charity Water, and uh, some of the initiatives that we'll have going forward and where the future of hydropeptide will go. So we've mentioned this idea that hydropeptide is clinical result and luxury experience. Now, this is a really important part for me. Um, I think that clinical results are a very important part of skincare, but I also love to talk to dermatologists about how important luxury experiences are. Uh, when we go to trade shows and meetings with dermatologists, I will sometimes talk to them about clinical results and luxury experiences. And luxury experiences, the pampering side, they say, no, nah, that's not important. And so then I talk to them and I say, if you give your customer, your patient, a product and say, this has clinical results, take it home, use it every day, and they put it on their skin and it doesn't smell good, it doesn't feel good, how long are they going to use that product? And in Doctor terms, we use a, a special word to say compliance. Compliance for doctors is an important word because it means, will my patient follow my directions every day? In order for us to get clinical results, we have to love the products that we use. So it's a very important part. Luxury experiences allows ourselves to get excited about home care in, with our skin. If we don't love to use the product, we're not going to use it. So I love talk, talking to doctors about this, and then they realize, yeah, that really is an important part. So I often say, if you aren't excited to put on your products every day, you don't have the right products. But if you get excited where it's actually one of the most favorite things you do in the day, you get excited about your time that you get to use your skincare products, then you have some good products because that allows you to follow every day taking care of your skin. So clinical results and luxury experiences, both are critically important to getting great skin. And another thing that sets the peptide apart is our ability to challenge skin aging with secondary concerns. 
So many lines will have an anti-aging line and a line for just for sensitive skin and just for acne. But throughout our collection, every product addresses aging. Even if it's meant for sensitive skin, it will still address aging, which is important because I use sensitive skin as an example. Many clients who come in with sensitivity, and, and this could be said for, for many skin concerns, but for sensitivity in particular, they're looking for a product that won't irritate their skin. That's their number one concern. And yes, they may be concerned about aging, but they kind of put that aside because they just need something that won't hurt their skin. And anti-aging ingredients traditionally can be irritating and sensitizing. So by using hydropeptide, they're able to use a product that not only will not irritate their skin, but will also help their skin to be more resistant to sensitivity. So it will help their skin be healthier and they get an anti-aging benefit. So hydropeptide believes that you shouldn't have to choose between addressing aging and whatever else might be going on with your skin. That we can do both within the same product. So another important category for us is that we want to make sure that all of our products are completely beneficial to the skin. We sometimes call this our clean science approach. What we mean by clean science is that all of the ingredients that we use are both safe and beneficial to the skin. Uh, we don't want to have, for example, preservatives that cause irritation or inflammation to the skin. Uh, so we've worked hard. Uh, with new technology to formulate products that are free of parabens, phenoxyethanol, MIT, some of the traditional preservatives that have oftentimes also been uh, less beneficial to the skin. Uh, so we have this clean science approach to make sure that our products truly uh, help your skin and don't have any problems. Um, this is a, always a challenge because so many skin types are unique uh, to find uh, products that will be both for sensitive skin as well as others. And so we have our micro collection to focus on particular <laughs> skin types, but all of our products are going to be safe and um, remove any of those controversial ingredients. So we talked about how hydropeptide is committed to clinical results and luxury experiences. And what's important to note about that is that includes no downtime. So it's really important that our client's skin looks great right away. Like I said, I used to work in a spa that carried hydropeptide, and that was the best part of the treatment, was when they looked in the mirror and had that wow factor. Their skin looks great. They don't have to hide from the sun or not go out or you know, cover up flaking, things like that. So when I say no downtime, what I mean is that their skin isn't flaking, it's not red or irritated. It looks great immediately. And that's a big component of hydropeptide. Even with our most aggressive peels, they'll have no downtime, and they'll have great skin right away. All right. So I'll let uh, Aaron sit down for a minute because I want to tell you about my story. Um, I never thought I would be in the beauty industry. I never planned on being in the beauty industry. I uh, worked on a PhD, I got my doctorate at the University of Illinois in molecular biology and studied a field called epigenetics. Um, I did have a connection with the beauty industry though um, because my older sister, who I love dearly, was and has always been in the beauty industry. And she called me a few years ago to just give me an update on her life. Uh, she had just sold a company that she had uh, developed for a pregnant woman uh, that was a, a very be beautiful line. And she had just sold that company to, uh, to uh, an investor. And she said at that time that she was looking for what to do next and uh, the founders of Hydropeptide had approached her and asked if she would come on board as a managing partner. And so she had told me that she had joined a company called Hydropeptide. And I kind of laughed and I said, Annette, do you even know what a peptide is? And she didn't at the time, uh, but she was really excited about what the company was doing and what its mission was and what they wanted to do with their skincare. And I told her, I said, you know that peptides is something that I've worked on quite a bit in my research. 
and that peptides as signaling molecules is a lot of the area of research that I've studied for my PhD. And she got very excited about that. And one thing led to another where I would get phone calls from her and she would ask me questions, um, science questions, like how does this work or how does that work? And one thing led to another that in about 2013 I became an official advisor for hydropeptide. And I got so busy with so many activities and it was becoming so fun that I decided to join full-time in 2014. One of the reasons why I joined hydropeptide is because I think that there's an opportunity within the beauty industry to really make a difference in how we approach skincare. And that there are some key things that we've learned in science that will really um, be impactful for the future of the skincare industry. And so today, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, why I believe that epigenetics is going to change the face of skincare. That we're really going to impact um, a new treatment technology going forward that will change how we do skincare in the future. And that we can really start to approach finding that fountain of youth. Okay? So uh, I asked a little bit earlier if anyone knew what epigenetics was. And everyone's kind of not really. Has, has everyone heard genetics? Okay, we know genetics, right? All of us know that genetics is referring to our DNA and that it's referring to the genes we have. Well, today I want to share with you a little bit of what I did for my PhD and, and hopefully show you how that applies very much to skincare. Okay, this first slide is one of the first slides in my presentation when I was uh, presenting my thesis work. I, it's talking about the complexity of the genome. Uh, when we talk about our bodies, the human body is an amazing organism. We have a lot of cells in our body. In fact, we have three times 10 to the 13th cells that make up the human body. Three times 10 to the 13th <laughs> is a lot. Too big of a number for us to really fathom, but it's a lot of cells. And when you look at the human body, when we look around at all of us, we all have an amazing body. We've got arms and legs. We've got eyes. We've got liver. We've got uh, all of these amazing components that make us who we are. We have a brain that helps us to think, to make and synthesize sentences that we can talk today in English, that you can translate it in your head to what you need to understand because you have more than one language that you can speak. All of that happens because of an amazing human body. Now, within our body, we have, in every single cell, a lot of proteins. Two times 10 to the 12 proteins per cell. These proteins are doing all of the work. The proteins within our cell make everything happen. They help the energy flow. They help us to have the energy that we need to move, to do different things. So these proteins are really important. They're the workhorses of our bodies, okay? These proteins are generated by over 50,000 gene products. So everyone's heard of genes, right? We all have different genes. What that means is that the genes are the part of the DNA, this double helix here that we all are familiar with. There are sequences or sections of the DNA that are called genes. That's where a, the DNA is readable and tells us what protein it should make. Okay? We're all a little bit unique as human beings because those genes are a little bit different for each of us, okay? So in biology, we have a really important um, concept that says DNA is the blueprint of life, okay? We call it the blueprint because it has all of the information that we need in order to function. And what happens is as a blueprint, it gets red, and the main thing that happens when it's red is it produces protein. So those genes are parts of the blueprint to tell us what protein we should make, okay? Now why this area of research is so fascinating to me is that while we have all of this information, lots of big numbers, we only have one genome. So what does genome mean? What it means is that your DNA is your one genome. 
all of your DNA is one genome. Now we have what we call chromosomes. Chromosomes are our DNA. Does anyone know how many chromosomes we have? How many? 46. Yeah, you remember from yesterday, <laughs> yeah. didn't you? <laughs> you, you she remembered, but it's still impressive. Yeah. yeah. Good but job. We've all seen that shape, right? That X shape. This represents a chromosome. This is your DNA, the double helix, but in what's called the chromosome. We have 46 of these. We have 23 that we get from mom, 23 that we get from dad. Okay. Everyone in this room has 46 of this X shaped, except me. I have 45 X shapes and one that's in the shape of a Y, right? You know, the X and Y, and that's what makes me a guy and all of you women. But these chromosomes are really important because they make up your DNA. Now here's where we're going to talk about what epigenetics is. This one genome is in every single cell that you have. So you have a lot of different cells, but you have the same DNA in every single cell. So in other words, you have a liver cell and an eye cell, and both types of cell have the exact same DNA. So how in the world, with the same DNA, does your liver cell know to be a liver cell, and your eye cell knows to be an eye cell? They're very different, right? They're doing very different things, and yet they have that exact same DNA. This is what epigenetic regulation is showing you. Epigenetic regulation refers to how that DNA blueprint is read, okay? How does it get read so that a liver cell knows to be a liver cell, and an eye cell knows to be an eye cell? This was particularly fascinating to me when I first started my molecular biology degree, in part because I'm actually an identical twin brother. This is not me. This is my identical twin. Here we are. We look a little bit different. We look a lot alike, too. We have the same genome. As identical twins, we actually have two bodies that have the same DNA. And yet we do look different, even though that DNA, that blueprint, is exactly the same, we look different. When we were in my, my mother's womb, he was what I call a placenta pig or a hog. He took up all of the nutrients. And because of that, when we were born, he was almost a kilo, kilo bigger than me. And so he's always been about three or four inches taller than me. I tell people he got the height and I got the looks. Okay? But it shows that even though we had the same DNA, the DNA is being read differently. It's being interpreted slightly different. Now he lives on the east coast of the United States and I live on the northwest coast. Now if we have different diets, if we have different sun exposure and different things like that, we will see different changes. Or if we have the same diet, we may start looking more and more alike as we grow older. So these influences are impacting how that DNA blueprint is red, okay? Now, hopefully as we start to kind of uncover what epigenetics is, you'll start to see how important this is to skin, and it, it very much for the aging process of skin. So let's talk a little bit about that. So when we talk about the DNA, that blueprint, it's static. It means it doesn't change. We don't want it to change, right? What happens if DNA gets mutated or changed? What kind of diseases occur? Down syndrome. You can have Down syndrome, cancer. When we think of cancers and all the different types of cancers, a lot of time it's because that DNA blueprint was misread or was changed. It was mutated. Down syndrome is another example. Uh, other diseases are when the DNA blueprint gets misread or is not being uh, static. So we want that DNA to stay the same. And yet we need to have it regulated or changed or read differently so that we can make our human body and so that we can also become healthy. Our, our healthy cells mean that the DNA is being read better than when you have an unhealthy cell. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, okay? So let's go one layer deeper into this so that we can kind of start to understand epigenetics. Okay, epigenetics 
when we look at a definition for this, it really is the control of gene expression without altering the DNA sequence, okay? So we're not changing the DNA, we're actually changing how the blueprint is read. Okay, epi, maybe you've heard the word epi before, like epicenter, what is epicenter? Have you heard that word before? That has to do with an earthquake. When an earthquake happens, they talk about the epicenter. That means right above where the earthquake occurred. Epi means above something. Okay, so when we talk about epigenetics, we're talking above the DNA. And that's kind of demonstrating how it's talking about how the DNA is read. Epigenetics doesn't change the DNA sequence, but it does interpret how it's read. Okay? So we've talked about these chromosomes. Here's a, a picture, a diagram of a chromosome. The DNA is very amazing. It's this long double helix thread that if you were to actually take just one cell and string out all of the DNA, it would be about one meter long. Okay? A long string of DNA is somehow wound up into a tiny cell. In fact, it's not just the cell. This tiny cell, if we use a diagram as a circle, there's an organelle inside the, the cell that's called the nucleus. And that nucleus is even smaller. And the nucleus is where the DNA is held. So somehow, the body is stretching this one meter of DNA and winding it up so tightly that it can fit inside that nucleus. Okay? So you can imagine, in order for it to do that, it has to wind it up really tightly. If you have a really long rope, and you want to tie, wind it up as tight as you can, you may loop it around your arm, or sometimes, like a ball of yarn, you may wind it up on itself, and that can really make it a lot smaller. Well, we actually do that within our nucleus. These chromosomes represent wound up DNA on these proteins called histones. Histones are proteins that the DNA winds around so that it can wind it up really tightly and to make up these chromosomes and fit inside these little tiny nucleus. Now here's the tricky part though. The cell has to be able to wind up the DNA to fit inside the nucleus, so it has to wind it up really tightly, yet we also talk about the DNA being a blueprint where it can be read. And what this means is that we have to make the DNA fit inside the nucleus while also making it readable. Parts of the DNA have to be expressed, and the way that DNA is expressed is by having access to it so that you can read the gene. You can read it, and it's being read by proteins that bind to the DNA and interpret what, mean, what proteins need to be made. So in every single cell in our bodies, we need to compact the DNA tightly while also making areas of it readable. And these epigenetic factors are very critical to making that happen. On the histones, we have histone tails that you have different epigenetic factors that can mark how compact or how tightly the DNA should be or how open or expressible. How, how, if it needs to be a gene that needs to be expressed, then it will be shown that you need to stay open and you need to be readable. The other factor that helps with this is an actual marker called DNA methylation, and it binds to the DNA itself, and that will help to interpret whether or not the DNA should be read, or if that gene should be read, or if it should be turned off. Okay? Now, we talked about the liver cell knowing to be a liver cell, and an eye cell knowing to be an eye cell. This is where this becomes really important. Because for a liver cell and an eye cell to be different, it means that different parts of the DNA are being read, okay? The liver cell and the eye cell, do they have the same DNA? They have the exact same DNA sequence, and yet there's something very different about them because an eye cell works very differently than a liver cell. This is because different parts of the DNA are being accessible, or red, while other parts are not, okay? 
liver cells have liver genes. These are genes that are going to only be read in a liver cell. But just as importantly, the nucleus in a liver cell knows to turn off I gene cells, or the I gene. So the genes that make up the I are told to be shut off or turned off in a liver cell. Likewise, in an I cell, I genes are being turned on, but the liver genes are being turned off. Okay? Does this make sense so far? Do you have any questions? Okay? Let's go one layer deeper into this, okay? This diagram is another one from my presentation when I did my thesis. This actually shows some of the work that I actually did. This blue area here represents the nucleus. It's a stain that I can see under a fluorescent microscope that stains the DNA. So this is what the DNA looks like in the cell that I was looking at. There's this kind of bright spot here, this kind of a lighter blue. It's also represented right here. This is a DNA that I inserted into this particular cell. So I was actually able to insert DNA into the cell. And you can see this particular DNA, <coughs> while it's a very large piece of DNA, it's tightly wound together. It's, it's compact, okay? We call this heterochromatin, or compact, or condensed DNA. What we were able to show in my lab was that if you introduce certain epigenetic factors to this location, you can cause the DNA to be go from closed to very open. This is the same DNA here and here. Yet in one spot, it's condensed, and in another spot, it's open. So this demonstrates how the nucleus can be changed so that DNA is either red or not red readable or not readable, okay? As we've started to learn more about this nuclear architecture, which means that how the DNA is bound into the nucleus, we've, we've been able to discover that there are certain areas where there are factors that help genes be more readable. We call these active chromatin bumps, which you don't need to know. I just think it's kind of a cool name. But these areas of the nucleus help genes that we need to have be turned on be readable, okay? Now, how does this impact skin? How does this influence the aging process? Well, this particular slide is showing you what I like to call the poised state of genes. Now, poised, I think, doesn't, it doesn't translate very well. But what poised means is standby, or to be ready. Some genes we need to have be ready to be either turned on or turned off. When we talked about the liver cell, we know that all of the I genes should be turned off completely. But there's some genes within the liver that need to be ready to listen and find out if they need to be turned on or turned off. This is part of what we call the signaling process of the cell, okay? This particular slide shows you these extracellular signals. This is part of the plasma membrane. This plasma membrane is a really cool membrane around the cell because it allows the cell to be put together. It's kind of like a little bag. It's allowing the contents of the cell to stay together while also protecting the cell from, other, from the outside. And so this plasma membrane also has important proteins on the membrane that communicate with the outside. So for example, in the human body, all of these cells that we have, they talk to each other. They communicate to each other about things that we need to have happen. By so doing, we can tell cells when something needs to happen or when it needs to not happen. So let me give you a concrete example of this. Um, in our skin, we know that there's an important protein called collagen. There's certain cell types in, in the skin that make collagen. Do you guys know what that is? What, what type of cell is it called? 
Yeah. Does anyone <laughs> remember? There's a cell type in the skin that makes collagen. It makes elastin. <laughs> Yeah, the fibroblast or fibroblast, that's how I would say it. But the fibroblasts are an important cell in the skin because they are the ones that make collagen. Now, how does it know to make collagen? Is it making collagen all the time? No, it's not. It's waiting. It's in that be ready state. So in the, in the fibroblast, the collagen gene is in that be ready state where it's waiting to be told to be turned on or to be turned off. Okay? And this happens through this epigenetic regulation. It allows the collagen gene in the fibroblast to be ready to be turned on when it receives the signal that tells it to turn on. Now you can imagine in the aging process what's happening is that this poised state or this be ready gene starts to not work as well. It can start to not see or, or hear the signal as well. Or sometimes, in particular cells, this poised state or be ready state gets turned off. Or in some genes, they become hyperactive. Okay? So when we look at this poised or be ready state, another way that you can look at it is kind of like as an on-off switch, right? You have a light switch where you can turn it on or turn it off. One way turns it on, one way turns it off, right? And we have lots of genes that are ready this way, okay? And so we could represent on as a one and zero as an off. And you could have different a pattern like this, where in a normal functioning cell, we have some genes that are turned on and some genes that are turned off. As we age, what happens is that some genes that we don't want to have turned on very often start getting turned on too more. They become hyperactive. Hyper, meaning too much. Hyperpigmentation, too much pigmentation is occurring. It's because a particular gene starts to get turned on too much. Or sometimes a gene that we want to be, have be very sensitive, like say collagen, starts getting turned off too frequently. And so when you look at the profile of a young, healthy cell versus an old cell, you start seeing differences in the pattern. And these patterns are important because they will demonstrate whether or not a cell is happy and healthy or if it's something wrong. When we talk about, for example, in skin, inflammation, irritation, those kind of things, inflammation and irritation are causing our happy state our healthy state of the cell to change. And in that changing process, if too much inflammation occurs, it starts to permanently change things. It takes the genes from this poise state and shuts them down. It turns them off completely. It alters the nuclear structure of the DNA such that those genes are turned off. And when that happens, there's problems because you have to reverse what has happened. How are we doing? Is this too much information? <coughs> we doing okay? Making sense? Yeah? All right.